This is Dr. David Allen. I'm talking with my colleague and director of our research department of the family, Keva Bethel. And one of the most outstanding studies she's done in the past few years is look at our suicide rate. This has been quite a challenge for us because um, Keva also did kind of um, a predictive study as well. Uh, you, you did something very creative. Oh, a perspective study. Yeah, how did you do sure. that? Um, so what we did is we sampled um, 276 Bahamians throughout all the islands, not just New Providence. And we asked them about 10 questions because we wanted to get an idea of um, how Bahamians feel about suicide, if they've thought about it, which is called the ideation, um, you know, if they knew anyone who had committed suicide. And the first question, if you go to slide nine, the first question we asked was, have you ever wanted to, com to commit suicide? Because we wanted to get an indication of, of the ideation, like if it's even in the Bahamian psyche. And what surprised us is about a quarter of the people answered yes to that question. Three quarters answered no. And you may say, okay, 25% or so, that's not much. But in, um, in the area of public health, uh, even one is just too much. We, we were always taught to go after the one. So if you have a quarter of your population saying, yes, I've thought about committing suicide, that, that's an issue. Um, the, yeah, Kevin, this was surprising uh -huh. because Bahamians don't like to admit this. Yeah. But what Kevin's research showed, a prospective study looks at where the country's going. going and, right. and that's the work in our family. We're not just looking at what's in the past, uh, what's happening now. We don't just look at sexual abuse. We're actually exploring how people are being sexually abused. And we're breaking that code of secrecy uh, and silence. And so what, what Kev is saying is this perspective study showed that nearly a quarter of Bahamians have thought of killing themselves. Now, I know when we sent the survey to one of the islands, um, the, the, one of the leaders called me and said, Dr. Allen, you're doing the devil's work, you know. Why do you want to know all this stuff about us? But I said, sir, we're trying to understand our country. But we were kind of shocked when the results came out, as she said, it's almost like, what, a quarter? Yes, almost said. a quarter. And that's, that, that, if, uh, if someone's looking at the whole thing and looking at it as a whole pie, 100%, they say, oh, a quarter, that's just a quarter. But that's 25% of your people, that, and, and, they, and they admit to it. They said yes. They circle yes, checked yes, put a box around yet. Yes, yes, yes. I have thought of, in some point in my life, of committing suicide. And you know, an, an act is always a thought, thought and first. a feeling first. So what we're saying, fellow Bahamians, let's wake up. Our country is facing some challenges. We're there facing, and we, we have faith. We're not doing this work with a kind of um, fatalism. Uh, we're out there uh, in different areas, and we see this. It's not to scare anybody, but the reality is your Bahamian family and colleagues and fellowships are saying that, yes, suicide is something they think about which means that when things get bad enough, as Kevin said, and that shame gap gets big enough, and I can't be what I was supposed to be, when I can't have what I'm supposed to have, when I don't have the power I was supposed to have, then somehow one option for me is to commit suicide. Now, Kevin, um, do you think this is going to be more prevalent in our young people? Um, I think so. I think so, because we had... Um we have a lot of um, incidences of adolescents in our family program right. who, who admit to cutting themselves. Right. So, so in other words, it seems that the other thing that is worrying us about the study is that now we're exploring adolescent teenagers, okay. and we have evidence to show that when a child is abused sexually in early life, he uh, can be a killer in later life between 16 and 24, but he can also kill himself. And as Kevin said, some of the young men particularly tell us, uh, Dr. Allen, we don't expect, expect to, to live, live long. long. Yeah. What, what does that mean, Kevin? What are they saying to us? They are saying to us that they want the best out of their life in the shortest period of time, which is um, probably why they, what people would say, living on the edge, I guess. And that's where you would see, and, and they have admitted, okay, we don't, we don't expect to live long. Hence, we want to um, um, have our children now. We, we, we see the issue of teenage pregnancy. Hence, they don't, and also they don't see the value of getting an education. They're saying, this isn't going to help me. I won't even be around long enough to, to use this education. So when you have that um, national debate about 
the national average on the um, BGCSE, BJCs, you have to look at all the factors. If these young people are saying, we don't expect to live long, we don't see the value in education, we want to hurry up, make some money, and hurry up have our children because I already know what I've done and someone's coming to get me. So, you know, so. I really want to stress this because um, this is what we call chronic psychological fatalism, which really means our young people, the ones who are challenged, the ones who have been abused sexually and physically in early childhood, they literally tell us they don't expect it of long. Many of their friends have seen killed. Many of their neighbors have been have seen killed. Many of their own families have seen maimed. And of course, uh, they've seen negative things happen in their community so much. And they have a high PTSD score, as well as being depressed. And so they say they don't expect to live long. Now, what our concern is that the average age for most suicides in the past in the Bahamas was between 33 and 44. To 44, 44. Yes. And Keva, what you're a little concerned about is that if we don't work hard to help people face their inner life and grow, grow, grow their inner life, that we could see that dropping among our young people. Already, our murder rate. Well, the, ho the homicide rate is really high in that age bracket that you're talking about. Right. So it Th would Those be who get killed and those who do killing between right, 16 and 25. That, that age bracket, 35 to 44, when we discussed previously that um, they, the, the gap between their expectations and reality, the younger people aren't even living long enough to be disappointed in themselves. Do you, do you understand? Good point. Yeah, and so. that's important, Kevin, because you see, years ago, those who killed in our country and were hung were in that 33 to 44 older. Right. Now, in the past few years, the average age of the Bahamian murder is between 16 and 24. And our work has shown that young, a lot of these young men were um, um, victims before they became perpetrators. Right. So we go right back to what we've uncovered in our work with the family, or like 400 people a week, is that we have a silent, shameful epidemic of sexual and physical child abuse. Now, the good news is we're not just diagnosing that. It's easy to diagnose and say we have this and that. Our challenge is, can we correct it? Yeah. And so for the first time in the 10 years of the family, we have certain families where people are expressing, yes, I was abused sexually by, 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 by a child. I was abused by my relative. I was abused by my neighbor. And they're working through that pain. And it's interesting, I, we have, I know we have a sample of at least 10 people I can think of right now who literally were abused as children and who have tried to kill themselves. So there's a direct correlation of fellow Bahamians between child abuse, physical child abuse, because we beat very heavy, and sexual child abuse, and later years going into homicide or going into home, uh, suicide. I hope you see the parallel and why we're working at this level because you've got to go down and get the data uh, and you only get data from Bahamians if you get kind of what I call a coochie coochie connection. And that's why the family is so important. We have people who have been in our family for five or six years. So when they tell you what's going on with me, you better listen because they're not shamming, they're not trying to impress. If you just go off on the street and do a suicide, a suicide study, you get all kinds of data. But when you go into the family and hear people talk about it, how they were abused, how they were sexually abused, and they're breaking the code of shame and silence, and then they can tell you how they felt suicide. You now see the link between uh, the child abuse and tra trauma and or suicide and also a homicide. Yeah. And it's, I wonder how that affects you as you got into this study. It, it was, it was eye-opening. I've um, been here my whole life and I had no idea that it, it's a very, um, it's a covert epidemic. You, you hear about them like in like maybe one here, one there, but you you wouldn't think that it's so it's so prevalent. Like when you look at it and you combine all the cases, and you know, in a study with 96 incidences for 83 to be male, so our young men they aren't just killing each other; they're killing themselves. 83 males, that's 13 females. Yes, we're concerned about the females, but 80 for 83 of our Bahamian men that could have still been here contributing to society, being constructive and whatnot. And they're also being killed homicide, right? Yes. So, and one particular one struck you, I think. He'd come home, he went to college. Right. Tell us about that one. Well, we, I, abstracted, well um, I abstracted a case where there was this young man and um, he went abroad and studied and earned a, um, a college degree and he came home and couldn't find a, 
gainful employment and he, he shot himself and he left a note. I've um, also um, had access to a lot of the suicide notes left. And his note said, um, if there had to be a reason, it, it, it's economics. So you have to, again, that's that shame gap. Okay, I'm expected to come home and secure a good job because my parents invested in this valuable education. But the reality is I have this valuable education and I'm unemployed. So where do I go from there? He, there, there was that shame gap again. He just couldn't. So Kevin, as a young, intelligent professional, this is a serious thing for our country. Because yes, people so study hard. That's they one of many cases. They go away to these very great right. colleges, and they come back looking for a job. Right. And somehow they expect, I'll be hired. Right, because that's, that's the not. dream that society has sold you from, hey, you work hard Sorry, in high school. Society what? That's the dream that you were sold, especially coming up in, in school if you've um, been educated here. You know, that's what your teachers tell you, like, go, to, go off, get a good education, come back, contribute to society. That's the dream that you were sold. So you go and you work hard. And his, his degree was not an, an easy, not that any subject is easy, but it was high tech, you know. So to go off and achieve that and to come back and your parents, when you look at the sacrifices and then to come back and it's, especially, I guess, being a young man, the, maybe his identity was wrapped up in his um, funds. And if you don't have any funds or employment then. And Kev, are you saying we may see more of this because a number of Bahamians are now staying away right. because they just don't see a future for themselves in the country. And you're saying that if they get their qualifications, come back here and kind of get a job commensurate with their qualifications, you see how that shame gap could increase and that will create some serious issues for the country. Yes. Yep. I know you were very moved by that example. Well, that's, that's one, that's one of, of many um, cases and stories that we have been in this work about a little over five years now, and uh, we hear so many stories like that. So, it, you know, if people, that might have been um, what we would say, the straw that broke the camel's back. Like, that might not have been the only issue going on with him, but, when, you know, you just never know what that one issue will be that'll put you over the edge, so to speak. He might have already had a plethora of problems and different issues, and then, okay, now I have this degree, can't find a job, and, you know. What Kev is saying, we are a consumer society, and when we see we can't make it, get enough money or get a job with some kind of prestige or whatever or power, somehow the shame gap increases, the gap between what I expect for myself and what I have achieved, actually, and the bigger that gap, then the next step is doing something that's detrimental, like suicide. We're going to take a break and be right back.